Um, you know, I, I think the Electoral Reform Society are very good, a uh, lot of people to be initiating, well, initiating, but on this occasion, initiating the discussion about how you get more women's representation, more fame uh, in involvement, both voters and as representatives. Um, lots of questions, you know, are all women shortlists uh, a permanent necessity or although they come, we don't need them anymore. Um, is there a problem that it, they, they detract from other groups who might also <coughs> feel they need uh, special shortlists? Um, how do non-binary, genderqueer, trans candidates fit into a 50-50 campaign? Uh, what do we do about the fact that, you know, the undeniable fact that Labour chose men as leader, deputy leader and London mayoral candidate? Um, say nothing of the top jobs having gone in the first place to, uh, to men again. Uh, so I'm going to start by asking our speakers to say a few words and then we'll throw it open to all of you. First of all, Katie Ghosh, who is the Director of the Electoral Reform Society. Great, thank you very much, um, Polly. Welcome, everyone. It's always um, kind of inspirational when we can all kind of actually get out of bed this early and make it here for what I think is going to be a really, really great discussion. Um, the Electoral Reform Society has come together with Labour Women's Network, um, Nan Sloan, and I guess we just felt at the beginning of this Parliament, it was really would be really important for the party, which we hope will and should be thinking about diversity in the kind of broadest forms, diversity in terms of candidates, MPs, but also diversity of the voting public. Mm -hmm. And we just thought this was a really good time to come together and hopefully have a really in-depth look at how the world is changing around us and then perhaps encourage or inspire the party to sort of have practical, practical political plans that would be capable of, of implementation. So with that in mind, just a little bit of, of scene setting really, we all know there are these long-term demographic changes taking place all around us with profound political changes, um, implications, and it's something that Jeremy Cliff has written about and is calling, you know, the Londonization of, um, <coughs> of Britain. Also, the urbanisation, when you look at what's happening and, and the kind of implications there, and this is a, a global trend of, of people flocking to cities, what happens both to them and the, the diversity implications there, but also the people who aren't there and in rural areas. So I think it's really important to look at those demographic changes and diversity in the kind of broadest um, sense. Um, what's going on around us? Well, by around 2025... Um, Britain will be about as diverse as America is now. So our, our minority uh, population as a proportion of the total is converging with that of the United States, which is really, really interesting. And mixed race people are actually now the largest ethnic group under 16. So again, I think it's really important when political parties are actually thinking about you know, black and minority ethnic groups, what is the true diversity of that group of people in society? And it's changing all the time. It's really changing all around us. Um, another big demographic change is, is obviously um, the kind of party fragmentation and the dealignment, which is really following the, the fragmentation of identities. And I think parties can't just take a, any group for granted, can they, when they're doing that kind of electoral strategy. It's just not possible to kind of pick out a group and say they're definitely going to be for us, because people don't identify like that. People identify in lots of different, um, lot, lots of different ways. Um, and just one example of that might be the sort of slowly growing awareness of, of gender identity issues, the, the issues that transgender people are, are facing. It seems as though there's a, a bit, there is more awareness that the issues and the practical obstacles that that group might face are, are still going to be absolutely tremendous. And you could say that for many, many other groups as well. There are real structural obstacles in the way of people participating in politics. And I hope that people will kind of really contribute to that debate from, from any group side aspect or perspective or their own individual perspective. Um, so I guess, what, what does that mean for parties? Well, it means they've got to re reach a much broader base um, of, of people now in order to, to win. Um, something that, that, this is a challenge to put out there, so, so Jeremy Cliff and the work he's done, he said the only future as a big majority winning party of government is a cosmopolitan one, relatively open to the world, socially liberal and comfortable with the country's plural, multi-ethnic society. Well, some people might feel and think that, others might <coughs> contend that that kind of approach could, could actually alienate so many other people in the country. So I'm just sort of putting that out there really as something for us to grapple with. 
And last night at a, another meeting, um, at the Electoral Reform Society meeting, a lot of our speakers were reflecting on the scale of the electoral challenge for Labour at the next election, when you just actually dig down into the detail and you look at the number of marginal seats, the swing that would need to be achieved for the party to come back into power. And actually this discussion we're having today about the, the diversity, the demographics, what, what the actual population as it will be in 2020, I think is a really kind of crucial part of that discussion. So some of the questions um, I guess I think we should put out there is how does the Labour Party and indeed other parties equip itself to deal with the very rapid demographic changes that Britain is seeing? Does Labour need new ways and means for ensuring diversity in, in its ranks? Is it time to look at some of the things that have been tried and tested? And the party's had a very impressive track record in some areas, but are those things working or does it need a whole other raft of measures? What about the regional changes? There's this rise in identity politics, particularly in Scotland, mm -hmm. and the nature of devolution, and that is, you know, literally the democratic landscape is changing all around <coughs> us. And what does that mean for any kind of diversity plan? What about the negative reactions to diversity, the rise of nationalism? That can be, for some people, a, a negativity, a kind of an anti-feeling. So how, how's the party going to respond to that? <coughs> and then finally, there's been this kind of really interesting um, discussion about the party itself. Should it devolve as a party so that it can both structurally and practically be different in different places and among different groups? And, that, of course, that's an idea that's come out of what's happened in Scotland. And people, I'm sure, have very strong views on either side. So I think that's um, it's been really, really good, I think, for ERS and Labour Women's Network to come together for this discussion. Um, and just wanted to echo that what we really wanted was it for absolutely to be a, a discussion and a, and a conversation. And I hope people will feel really free to come forward with whatever ideas and insights that you've all got. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think the reason why the ERS, this is a question that particularly uh, is for you, is that the electoral structure of the electoral system itself so predicts who gets a chance to get elected and how diverse is the range of candidates you get in first place or get elected. Next, um, Jess Phillips, who's uh, MP for Birmingham, Yardley, and well known to you all, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go home and not be a celebrity anymore. I'm going to walk around my local Sainsbury's and expect people to be like, oh, Jess, I know who you are. Um, so, yeah, as, as has been said, uh, I'm a newly elected Member of Parliament, and, and one of the roles that I have in Parliament uh, is that I sit on the uh, Women and Equalities uh, Select Committee, uh, which is very much in its infancy in looking at all the sort of issues that you have uh, identified. Um, I suppose I should try and speak from the Labour Party's perspective, uh, being the um, Labour Party Member of Parliament here today, and I, I think that the Labour Party has a, still a, an enormously long way to go um, in sort of diversity in Parliament and making sure that we are speaking properly to all the different groups um, outside the electorate. Um, the, I mean, uh, just in the bar the night before last, uh, uh, a gay man came up to me and he was talking to me and he was saying, oh, you know, uh, just being enthusiastic about his role on the council. And I was saying, oh, you should try and become uh, an MP. And, uh, and he said, oh, you know, I would really love to, but there's one, one real problem. Uh, that's all women shortlists. And I was like, oh, my heart sort of sank, you know, I'm now going to have to shout at you. Uh, for not liking all women shortlist. <laughs> this is just awful. Um, and, and, and he was very much saying it, representing it, uh, as that he was a gay man. And I, so I asked him, do you think that we should have LGBT... T I'm, I, I'm, every time they add new letters on, I'm, I'm sticking with LGBT, but I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, to be corrected. Um, the, uh, do you think there should be shortlists? And, and, and he said... He said just outrightly know that there shouldn't be, but he couldn't expand on that any further. And I, I think that he was probably potentially a bit worried to say that we need to have shortlists for that, shortlists for this, shortlists for the other. And, and part of me, I can, I can see where he's coming from, but uh, what I, I mean, I'm sure Nan will speak about it. She knows an awful lot more about it than I do. But actually, it takes those groups of people organising together and demanding action, waiting to be given it by the Labour Party, I am sure, 
will never happen um, um, because you have to take this sort of power rather than wait for it to be given. And he seemed reticent in this sort of equalities environment to sort of demand that. Um, the Labour Party, we have the, the gayest parliament in the world, is it? Mm -hmm. I, I was really worried that somewhere like Azerbaijan's or everyone's going to come out. Um, so we were lining people to come out in, in Britain just in case that happens. Um, so we, we, there are, have been real advances in Parliament um, around LGBT representation, but obviously I think in the Labour Party we have a long way to go. Um, I think that the group that I identify as uh, being the greatest gap is disabled people, I would say Parliament is woefully lacking in people with uh, disabilities and one of the reasons, um, like I say, it takes uh, individual groups to get together and organise uh, to get their people in there and once they're in there to organise and take the things that they want and no greater example than that is some of the amazing things that Harriet Harman has achieved in the, the 30 years I've been alive that have affected my life and at the moment disabled people are in lacking a voice in Parliament and that is showing in the policy that is coming out the other side. Um, so there the definitely, I think, needs to be some, some real focus around dropping the barriers, helping people to organise, encouraging people to organise, and, and letting people be bold enough to say, yes, I want special measures for me, yes, I want a version of all women's shortlists for me, and it's, it's people seem a bit reticent to even say that. Um, I think that I've recently taken part in um, a transgender um, inquiry uh, on the Women in Equalities Committee, and I'd say the structural discrimination against that group is so, 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 so far away from being anything that could, can be overcome at the moment. It is, I mean, it just seems that people do not tolerate and or accept transgender issues, uh, the idea of sort of self-declarations, the idea that people, are, the, 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 the hardest area is, is those that don't identify as any gender. Um, but I, I like to think that there's one, there's a policewoman uh, at Parliament who is transgender and she was on a couple of TV programmes and she's like heralded in Parliament as being this amazing woman and she like, you know, she scans you when you go in and out of Parliament. Um, and it's sort of like Parliament pats itself on the back that they know a transgender person. <laughs> <laughs> it's really like, oh, I, oh, have you seen you know, a police officer down there? She's transgender, don't you know? And that, that is genuinely what Parliament is a bit like. It's a bit like people just thinking it's OK a bit in a sort of tokenistic. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that the Labour Party as well has, for the past five years, been quite interested in class as, a, um, as an issue and, and uh, a reason why people didn't get into Parliament. And I am a product of both the Labour Women's Network training and pushing and uh, opening doors for me, uh, as well as I am the Labour Party's Future Candidates Programme, which was very much about getting people from ordinary walks of life, more working class people, um, into politics. And so the Labour Party is very much trying to do that. Um, but I think it needs to go a bit further, if I'm honest. Thank you very much, Dean. I have a very important message. <coughs> more coffee has arrived and there's still lots more food. So do feel that you can just get up in the middle of this and go over and get more of it, if that's what you'd like. Next, we're going to hear from um, Nan Sloan, who is the director of the Centre for Women and Democracy. And also, with my Labour Party hat on, um, the training co coordinator for Labour Women's Network. And I'm going to talk a bit with both hats, as it were. Um, the first thing, I think, is that we should recognise where we are. I'd speak specifically in terms of gender, which is the, my area of expertise, but it reflects on other areas as well. And I think, uh, and I will come on to talk about some of the challenges and what we still need to do, but I think we ought to recognise that um, as a whole, politics is a very different place from where it was 20 years ago. And that what Labour has done has made a significant difference to that. 
Um, but it also, I think we need to recognise that it's not just Labour. This is not just Labour's issue. This is an issue for the whole of politics. And so, at the same time as we certainly ought to be looking at the Lib Dems and saying, oh dear, no women, uh, or conversely, oh dear, only white men, um, and <coughs> uh, looking at uh, uh, who David Cameron is appointing to his cabinet and in what roles they're going, we ought also to look at the Conservative Party and say that since 2005, they've gone from 18 women MPs to more than 60. <coughs> and they haven't done that simply by hoping it, it would be so. They've done that by doing things which have not included positive action as the Labour Party understands it. So although the Labour Party has had by far the greatest success, <coughs> 1987 there were 21 women, Labour women MPs, which is why Labour Women's Network got set up, because women lost patience, because 21 Labour women MPs was exactly the same number as there was in 1945, and in between 1945 and 1987 it actually dipped. <coughs> so that in 1987, people were celebrating having 21 Labour women MPs. So uh, uh, one of the uh, reasons for Labour Women's Network coming into existence was women getting together and saying, right, that's it now, we have to stop, what do we need to do in order to, to create change? And what they did was a two-pronged effort of setting up a training programme for women and a networking um, enabling women to uh, network much more effectively within the party and campaigning within the party for positive action measures. Um, so I think we ought to, to, to say that in, in terms of how diverse is our parliament now, it's much more diverse than it was 20 years ago, and it is diverse in ways that we could not have imagined 20 <coughs> years ago. So there are hardly any... Um, uh, out gay MPs 20 years ago, there were no, certainly no lesbian MPs 20 years ago. It, it was inconceivable 20 years ago that there would be lesbian Tory MPs, which there are now. So <clears throat> I think we should recognise we've made huge strides, but we also ought to recognise that there are still huge strides to go. I think the Labour Party is in a different position from other parties in terms of gender because it has had 20 years of its shoulder to the wheel and that has resulted in 43% of Labour MPs being women and a situation where whatever the result in 2020, provided the Labour Party continues to implement its current policy in relation to all and shortness, the Parliamentary Labour Party will be 50% female. It's almost impossible for it not to be. Not because, um, uh, it, it, mainly because of the party's, uh, um, mainly because of the party's policy of making sure that 50% of candidates in seats where the MP retires mm -hmm. are women. And of course those are the seats where even in a catastrophic year you're likely to win. And so there is now a core of women in the Parliamentary Labour Party who are not looking over their shoulders <coughs> all the time at their majorities, who are able to function as um, uh, members of Parliament without the constant need to be somewhere else all the time, which is what happens if you're in a marginal seat. Um, and that, is, that makes the Parliamentary Labour Party qualitatively different, and it also makes it much harder for the percentage of women to go down. So that's good. That has only been achieved by the use of all we shortlists. If I put my work hat back on again, there is no country in the world that has achieved a decent representation of women without the use of positive action and without the use of quotas. And so when people sort of say to me, ah yes, but there has to be another way of doing it, the answer is if you could find it and let everybody know what it is, <laughs> you'll make a fortune as a consultant <laughs> because believe me, people would pay to find that out. But to date, nobody knows how you do it without the use of quotas in some form or another. And if you go through the top, you know, there's a, the International Parliamentary Union produces a uh, list, a ranked list of countries around the world in terms of gender. Um, uh, we've done, Centre Women in Democracy have done an analysis of the uh, top countries and their electoral 
systems and the, whether or not they've used quotas. In regards to the electoral system, somebody somewhere has to use quotas in order to get the percentages up much easier with a sensible electoral system, much harder with first past the post, but possible. So um, I think as a, as a party, we should not be having the discussion about should we continue to use all these shortlists or not, because it's the only thing that works. Uh, that's it. If you abandon all these shortlists, the numbers will go down. The Scandinavian countries, usually held up to us as a model of how to do this, used all women's shortlists to get the percentage up. They now do not use them, the percentages are falling. So there's no point at which everybody suddenly goes, oh yes, women and men, we will treat equally. That is not what happens. What happens is quotas get percentages of women up. Quotas are useful where you are addressing a problem which is unique to uh, addressing a male-female issue, women are a majority of the population. And all women shortlists address the problem where you are trying to get fair representation for a majority. There is no constituency in the country which does not have somewhere around 50% women. The whole country is somewhere around 50% women. Um, and so uh, quotas work in terms of the, the, there is, people may disagree about the mechanism, but they can't disagree that the, it is evident where people are represented, evident where that population is. The challenge for everybody, and this is a challenge uh, across the board in, in most countries, is how then do you pr uh, find a way of promoting equality for minority groups and um, that's actually a different challenge and to take a mechanism which is used in order to rectify the underrepresentation of the majority I did something with um, a, a group of international um, uh, delegates uh, yesterday and one, sorry, the days merge after a while. <laughs> and <laughs> and, af, and, and uh, uh, one of the men there said to me, I don't understand uh, how it is that we don't tolerate apartheid in, we didn't tolerate apartheid in, this is a man from an African country, we didn't have, uh, tolerate apartheid in South Africa, which is the oppression of a, minor, of, of a majority by a minority, but we do seem to tolerate the oppression of, a majority by a minority when it comes to gender, which I thought was an interesting question. Um, but it does demonstrate that's, that's the, the issue. The issue we now have to resolve is how do we address the underrepresentation of minority groups, of groups which might be harder to identify, of groups who may not feel that a precursor for them getting adequate representation should be that they have to declare themselves in a way that nobody else has to. So nobody has to get up and say, hello, I'm a straight, white man. <laughs> I'm confident about my race. I'm confident about my gender. And I'd like a seat, please. And yet every other group is first expected to identify who they are. We talk about self-identifying women. We talk about non-identifying um, people. So that, And I think that's a real issue. And I do think it is lazy to take all women's shortlists and say, well, if we just do that, it'll all be fine. Because it won't all be fine. And, um, and we'll end up using that not necessarily to crack the right set of problems. And so what we really need is some much more original thinking about how we do this. We need groups to talk to each other about how they're going to do this. We need people to go and look at what's happening elsewhere. What is happening in the States? Are there any countries where they've really given this some some hard thought and come up with some answers, uh, or are we going to have to come up with them for ourselves, in which case who is going to come up with them, and how are we going to persuade all political parties to implement them? Because, I will finish on, on this, the United Kingdom is only where it is in the International League table, which is about after the last election, 36, probably now, by now 37 or 38 because of what the Labour Party has done. So even with the Conservative Party's um, big changes in the last 10 years, the United Kingdom would be somewhere around 90th, 
without the Labour Party's positive action programme. And so the other question that the Labour Party, I think, in the wider interests of democracy has to ask is, why are we doing all the heavy lifting and how can we help the other parties to share the load? Because the underrepresentation of women is not just an issue for the Labour Party, it's an issue for our democracy <coughs> as a whole. And it's not just the Labour Party's <coughs> responsibility to solve it, it's our democracy as a whole which has to solve it. And so I think we have to be much less tribal about the uh, diversity of our democracy as a whole and more willing to talk to the other parties <coughs> and to help them to deal with this in their own terms, which will be different from ours, and to learn from them. We actually <coughs> ought to be talking to Conservative women and saying, how did you do this? Because they did it in the teeth of ferocious opposition and they haven't used quotas to do it. So they're, they're going to be much slower to get to 50% than we are because they're still only at, they're still under 20% because of the size of the Conservative group. But nevertheless, they have gone from tiny to a reasonable number of women who are now a force within the Conservative Parliamentary Party. And I think this is a problem for us all, not just a problem for us in this room. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's terrific. Just one <coughs> point of information. You said that we were the most, uh, that we were the Parliament that had the most out gays. Yep. Really? Britain is the what gayest parliament. I never knew this. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't read all the articles <laughs> I should have done. <laughs> yeah, it's the gayest parliament. We were going to have a big party. How many? To celebrate. I, do you know, actually, funnily enough, uh, I have tried to look it up. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I'm not entirely sure of the numbers, but uh, when me, me and a friend of mine were trying to look it up, and it's not it's not that clear, and there isn't actually just a list anywhere, which maybe in on reflection is probably a good thing. <laughs> These are the gay people. Point at them. Um, but it is it is it, after the last election, it was definitely the gayest yeah. parliament <laughs> in the world. Is it? Is, is, you're looking for a list. Find me a list. I, I think I've got the report somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. That I, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Now let's throw it open for general discussion. Uh, there are so many different strands.